I would like to thank the Indian Academy of Sciences, the Academy Trust, and the DAV School for this opportunity of spending time with students. As Professor Mujumdar said, the aim of these talks is to tell, tell young minds about what to think, what not to think, how to think. So there will be more than I would be actually able to express in these talks in this talk of one hour. Prime number, uh, well, I've chosen prime number because everything starts from numbers. Mathematics starts from numbers, although it goes into several directions, which after a while perhaps uh, become so abstract that it's difficult to relate them to numbers. So one of my aims in this talk will be to show towards the end uh, how a very abstract branch of mathematics actually relates to numbers. You can go there from numbers. So from numbers, one can go in different directions. There are people working in number theory. But since I don't work in number theory, I'll, I'll show how, how one can go from numbers to something which should really be called mathematical logic. But that's just one direction. There are many, 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 many directions that one could go into. So at several places in this talk, I'll say something and then kind of leave some other things open uh, for, for whoever is interested to explore later. These days, because of Google search, you can get good sources. And in the references at the end, I'll also list some uh, reliable sources. Like Professor Mujumdar said, not everything is correct. Not everything on the web is correct. So I'll list some. And uh, so the aim, aim is at various places there will be there will be things of which I'll probably be able to give a glimpse, and the and the details uh, will be up to you. Okay. You all know what integers are. The numbers uh, like this, say minus hundred or plus twenty five. These are integers. But integers these are kind of natural, right? I mean. Positive integers are very, very natural, and negative integers are like, like well, uh, if realistically, one might say that when one borrows from a bank, let's say, that's a, that's a negative integer. If one borrows 5,000 rupees, that's minus 5,000 rupees earned. That's a way of thinking of it physically. Mathematically, mathematicians have come out to, with, the, with, the, with, the note, uh, with the definition that a negative integer is something which when added to the positive integer gives zero. That's, that's an abstract mathematical definition. It's a, it's a, uh, mm, so additive inverse of a positive. We shall, we shall, in this talk, we'll be we shall be concerned only with non-negative integers, the most comfortable ones. The positive integers the, form the primary subject matter of arithmetic, and arithmetic is what we shall do for most of this talk. You say that A is divisible by, so all A, B, C are positive here. If A is divisible by B, if there is another positive integer C such that A is B times C. There is a the notation for that, right, that B divides A. Uh, so one divides everything, A divides A, and A divides zero for every A. We shall also use B, does this, this notation for showing that B does not divide A, might not, but it's straightforward that if C divides B and B divides A, then C divides A, obviously, from the definition. If C divides A, then B is some CD, and A divides B, so A is some B times E, and since B is CD, so A is CDE, so C divides A. If B divides A, then BC divides AC. If C divides A and C divides B, then C divides M A plus N B for any M and N. Okay. These are simple things. The subclass of importance, they're called prime numbers. So if something, something is called a prime number, if P is greater than one, then what is the point of including one after all? So start from two. And the only things that divide P are one, because one divides everything, and P itself. And there is nothing else. So like two, three, five, seven, 11, 13, and so on. 
something which is not a prime is called a composite number. So like uh, six, six is a composite number because it's not a prime. So apart from one and six, two and three also divide. How to find primes? So long ago, very, very long ago, in 200 BC, there was someone called Eratosthenes. I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly. And I'll show you what he did. For that, I need to share something else. See what's being done. So suppose we want to find primes up to 120. Who is the first prime? Mark it. And mark all multiples of two. It's, it's, it's very easy. Of course. Right. Catch three and mark or mark out all multiples of three. And four has already been marked, so don't choose it. Now get five and mark all multiples of five. So you're now left with two, three, five, and then go to seven, mark all multiples of seven. And then, so note that what you will be left with are exactly the primes. This can be done up to any number, right? So this is called the sieve of, this, this is the sieve of, this is a sieve through which only the prime numbers are held. The rest, rest falls out. This is called the sleep, sieve of Eratosthenes. So the idea was very simple. You, 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 you start with two, well, start with a number up to which you want to want the want to want to catch the primes. Start with two, mark out all multiples of two, then go to three, mark out all multiples of three, and then don't go to four because four has already been marked. So only catch the unmarked numbers. Go to five, mark all multiples of five greater than five. And then, so obviously then six will not be there. Six has been in fact marked twice, once for two, once for three. So then go to seven and so on. Okay. So, so Eratosthenes was long ago, as I told you. And as you saw, the sieve is very simple minded. So obviously there have been attempts to improve. Now, I won't go into this because that will require quite a bit of explanation. And uh, I have many things to tell. But I'll, I'll leave you with the sieve of Sundaram. If you search for it, uh, you'll, you'll get umpteen number of, uh, Wiki, not just Wikipedia entry, but videos on, good videos on YouTube. To look up the sieve of Sundaram, again, not very difficult. If you spend half an hour, well, that should be enough to understand it. Now, in 1934, sieve of Atkin in 2003, again, uh, this is slightly more advanced and again kindly look for it. Also strongly recommend a new characterization of prime numbers uh, discovered by Agrawal, Kayal and Saxena in 2002. This is, uh, it's not very easy, but with some amount of effort you will, and this, this won't be understandable in half, half an hour, but maybe in one day. So, uh, so these are the things that so I, I hope I was able to explain the sieve of Eratosthenes, which was very simple, but please look for these other things. So there are ways to find prime numbers up to a certain number. Eratosthenes, a little bit of story. Eratosthenes of Serene from 276 BC to about 195 or 194 BC, not clearly known, was a Greek uh, so at that time, mathematics, geography, poetry, astronomy, etc., were the same thing. I mean, if anyone who did one of them did many of them. So he also did many of them. Uh, the chief librarian at the Library of Alexandria, the famous one, which unfortunately was burnt later, uh, invented the discipline of geography, but the most interesting stuff, again, something that you must look up in, in YouTube about how he did that is he measured the circumference of Earth. It's not very easy, but again, not very difficult. He had the brilliant idea of uh, uh, putting up a stick at a place and at noon, 
we measured the length of the shadow at that place and uh, uh, the, the length of the shadow of a stick of the same length at some other place. He knew the distance between these two places and from this distance and the length of the shadows, he could calculate the circumference of Earth. This is extremely interesting. He is most known for that. Okay. So we have seen uh, that prime numbers can be uh, detected with a reasonable amount of ease. Okay. Some elementary result, basic fact, every positive integer itself a prime or is divisible by a prime. Well, every positive integer is a prime or a composite number. So the only issue is to show that a composite number is always divisible by a prime number. Well, take a composite number. Uh, it, well, take a number. If it's a prime number, there is nothing to prove. If it's not, if it is not a prime number, then by definition, there is something else that divides it other than one and n. So m be the least of such divisors. Now then m has to be a prime. Because if not, then there is a positive integer between one and m that would divide m. But since that divides m, and m divides n. So that new thing that we have obtained will have to divide n, but that's less than m, but m is the least one that divides n. m is prime. So given any number n, either it's a prime or there is a divisor which is a prime. This, this looks very simple, but it has an extremely important consequence. Every positive integer is a product of primes. So start with a number n. If it's a prime, not, nothing to prove. If it's not a prime, then we first showed that there is a prime p1 that divides n. So to divide n by p1, you will get some m, and m is less than n. Now apply the same argument to m. So m, m is again p2 times something, p2 times some l, where l is less than m. This process continues, and uh, you will get smaller and smaller number. So at some point of time, the quotient that we get has to be a prime. So, because you are only dealing with finitely many numbers, it will have to stop at some stage. And how can it stop? Only by the quotient being a prime. Only then it stops. So, it shows that you keep on extracting the prime factors and that process stops at some time. Of course, P1 and P2 could be same. For example, I mean, if you are dealing with, uh, say, 12, then it's 2 into 2 into 3. So, P1 and P2 could be same. That's fine. Uh, so if that is fine, let me go to the last line. Don't look at the top of the screen. Now look at the look at the very last display. So it says that. So what we just proved in the last slide says that last slide says that any number n will be expressible as products of powers of primes. Okay, this is what we proved. Now this factorization is unique. Now look at the top. What does the word unique mean? What does uniqueness mean? Uniqueness means there is only one possibility. Now, of course, you should jump and tell me, well, I mean, you could write this, uh, this factor in, the, in the, the product in the last display of, the, of, of what is there on screen. Say for 12, you could write this as 2 square into 3, or you could write it as 3 into 2 square, or you could write it as 2 into 3 into 2. So it could be written in various ways as a factor. I mean, the things are same, but the orderings are different. Yes, the orderings could be different, but other than that, things are same. So uniqueness means that there's only one possibility. For example, when you solve an equation like 2x plus 3 equal to 5, there is only one x that satisfies it. Okay, uh, It's not possible that two different x's satisfy it. So it has a unique solution. So in that sense, this factorization is unique, meaning you can permute the factors, but subject to permutation, it's unique. Other than permutation, nothing, nothing else can, can change. So like here, it's p1 to the power a1, p2 to the power a2 dot dot dot. You could of course write it as p3 to the power a3 first, p1 to the power a1 at the fifth place. This kind of thing is possible, but, but this is just a permutation. Other than permutation, nothing else is possible. So the prime power factorization is unique. 
Okay, how many primes are there? Are there only finitely many prime numbers? And the very easy argument shows that this is not possible. Suppose there are only finitely many primes, list them. P1, P2 up to PK, first prime is 2, second one is 3, third one is 5 and so on up to some number PK. But then consider their product plus 1. This is not divisible by anything, by any of the P1, P2, PK. But there has to be a prime number that divides Q, which we, we, we just proved it. That any any number is either prime or 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 or, or, or is divisible by a prime. So if Q is not a prime, then there has to be a prime number that divides Q. So what have we done? We have found a new prime number. What was the argument? We listed. Suppose there were only finitely many primes. We listed them. Considered Q to be the product of P1 up to PK plus 1. Now, either Q is prime, in which case the proof is complete. If Q is not prime, then there has to be a prime number that divides Q. But none of the PIs divide Q. So, this new, this prime number that divides Q, it's new in the sense that it's not in our list. We found a new one. It's not possible that there are only finitely many primes. In a little bit of story more, I mean, everyone knows about Euclid, right? He was the father of geometry. He truly is the father of geometry. The planar geometry that we do was done by him. I bring in Euclid's name because what we are going to do next, uh, from there, there is an offshoot uh, called Euclid's algorithm in for finding GCD just for finding GCD, greatest common divisor. Now, you'll probably agree with me that if you have two very large numbers, finding that GCD is not easy. So there is an, there is an algorithm due to, attributed to Euclid, which does that. And it has some connection with, uh, with what we are going to do next. We won't do Euclid's algorithm for finding GCD. Again, I leave that to you to check. This is another thing. Uh, so there will be many such things in this talk which are accessible to you, you will be able to understand, but I won't really talk about them. I'll, I'll leave with the snippets. So that's why I bring Euclid's name. Um, and now we go into what's called the method of induction. I suppose many of you have seen this method of induction and we shall see why, uh, we shall see an example of it and we'll, we'll have occasion to use it. Mathematical induction is a method of mathematical proof typically used to establish that a given statement is true for all natural numbers, all positive integers. Positive integers are also called natural numbers. So something that is true for all natural numbers, like if you sum one plus two plus three up to n, it gives you n into n plus one by two. This is true for all natural numbers n. It's a very simple, uh, simple example of uh, of a property that is satisfied by all natural numbers n and a property that can be proved by the method of induction. You, I suppose you have done this by now, uh, proving this by a method of induction. Also, there is a very ingenious proof attributed to Gauss. So when Gauss was in school, I mean, this is a story that he was asked to, to basically to keep the class quiet. He, well, he was a little boy at that time. Carl Friedrich Gauss, uh, the father of modern mathematics, uh, he was uh, to probably keep, keep the class quiet. The teacher asked them to sum from one to hundred, and he thought this will take some time and it will keep the students busy. So what Gauss did is he wrote one, two, three up to hundred, one after another, and at the bottom of it he wrote hundred and then ninety-nine and ninety-eight all the way up to one. Now, when he summed these two rows, for every column, he got the sum 101. Because 1 plus 100, and then 2 plus 99, and then 3 plus 98, it goes on till 100 plus 1. So every column summed up to 101. And there are 100 columns. So the total sum is 100 into 101. 100 into 101. Now, this, this is twice the required sum because this because he wrote two rows of it. So the sum of sum from one to hundred is really half of 
100 into 101. Now, this is an ingenious method, and uh, obviously, it, it this 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 proof works for uh, obtaining n into n plus one by two. You can do the same thing. You can also use induction. Okay. What one does in induction is one first proves it for the case n equal to one, or maybe n equal to one and n equal to two, just to get get the feeling if one has a lot of time. And then was it assumes it till n minus one and proves it for n. So the argument is then if it is true for one, it will be true for two. If it's true for two, it will be true for three, and so on. Now, this is quite remarkable that uh, assuming that the statement is true only up to n minus one, you are getting it to be true for n. Here is an example of the application of the method of induction, the so called tower of Hanoi. It is really a game. Uh, invented by a French mathematician. Okay, the idea is as follows. Uh, you have n disks and they are of different sizes and in one of the stacks they are arranged uh, with in, in the following arrangement that the largest disk is at the bottom, then we have the second largest disk on top of it then the third large, largest disk on top of it and so on and you have n of them there are three uh, such uh, columns placed one after another and you have to transfer the job is to transfer all the disks from let's say from the tower a to the tower c there is only one condition well one can use the tower b in the middle that's an auxiliary tower and that can be used the job is to transfer all disks from tower A to tower C with the help of tower B. Uh, there is only one condition that you cannot place a larger disk on a smaller disk. So while using the tower B, you are not, uh, you, you are not allowed to first place a smaller disk and then on top of it a larger disk. So in other words, this ordering of uh, largest at the bottom and then slowly becoming smaller must be maintained at all time. Okay. And this is not easy. It takes a little bit of thinking. Uh, of course, the case of n equal to one is extremely easy. You just take it from air and a and put it at C. So it takes only one step. If n equal to one, the number of steps, re steps required to do the job is one. If n equal to two, note what happens. So I have two disks. So I take so at the first step, I take the uh, take the smaller one and put it in B. That's the first step. Second step, I take the larger one from A and put it in C. So I have exhausted I have exhausted two steps now. The third step is very simple. I take the smaller disk from B and put it in C. Try to try to think out think how we will do it for three, because for three the challenge starts. You can put the smallest one in B, but then what happens to the second smallest one? You cannot put it in B again. You will have to put it in C. But then what what after that? The only way to do it is then take the smallest one from B to C, and use B for the largest one, which still remains in A. So see how, how many steps it takes. For two, it takes three steps. In general, uh, for, for three, it will take seven steps. In general, the, it takes two to the power n minus one steps if you have three. In general, it takes two to the power n minus one steps. That's the answer. But I would strongly recommend that you Try it out for three, four, etc. This is fun. How to do this without at never with, with 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 never with never placing a bigger disk on a smaller disk. So how how is it uh, two to the power n minus one proof is there? There are there are various proofs. So 
So I'm, I'm doing this to illustrate the proof of induction. I don't know whether you have seen this one. You would have seen the application of induction for proving various formulas, which is usually done in class. So I'm trying to do something which is usually not done in class. So true for n equal to 1, we just saw n equal to 1, 2 to the power 1 minus 1 is 1. True for n equal to 2 as well. True for n equal to 3 also, you will be able to check by hand. Assume it to be true for n minus 1. Start with n disks. So assume that for n minus 1 disks, it takes 2 to the power n minus 1 steps minimum, the smallest number of steps. Of course, one could do it in more than that inefficiently. But the smallest number of steps is 2 to the power n minus 1. Start with n disks. Move the top n minus 1 disks to b. So b is this. So here, if you have n disks in A, leave the lowest one at A. That's the largest one. Leave that at A. In fact, you can't do anything with it. So leave that at A. But the top n minus 1, move them to B in 2 to the power uh, n minus 1 steps using C. This is the induction hypothesis, in fact. We are given that this can be done, right? That if I want to move n minus 1 of them from one to another using a third one, I can do it in 2 to the power n minus 1 steps. So that's the first thing I have written. Move the top n minus 1 disks to B. This requires 2 to the power n minus 1 minus 1 moves. So the, the ultimate result is 2 to the power n minus 1. So for n minus 1, it will be 2 to the power uh, n minus 1 minus 1. Okay. Now we are left with the largest disk, the bottom most one in A. Move that to C. Because finally it has to go to C. So that is one more move. Now A is empty. B has n minus one disks arranged in the right order. And C has just one, the, the largest one. Now this n minus one, which are in B, now can be moved from B to C using A into to the power n minus one. Sorry, there is a mistake. Two to the power n minus one minus one moves. So, totally, so now we, our job is done, mind you. How many moves did we take? First, 2 to the power n minus 1 minus 1. That was the first step, moving n minus 1 things from A to B. Then we made one move. Then we made another 2 to the power n minus 1 minus 1 moves. But this is 2 into 2 to the power n minus 1 minus 1 but that's just 2 to the power n minus 1. Okay. So this is an example of induction. So using, using the principle of induction, we are able to prove that in, the, in, in this game, this is a game, in this game, you are able to do it in 2 to the power n minus 1 steps. So that's an example for induction. We shall use induction to find how large the nth prime can be. First, the first prime is 2, the second prime is 3, the third prime is 5, fourth prime is 7, and so on. So if you list them like that, how large is the nth prime? We need a little bit of geometric series before that, which I suppose you know, but a quick recap. Um, if you want to sum 1 plus a plus a square up to a to the power n, what is the sum? Only up to a to the power n, finite sum. So multiply it by a, then you get a s, s for sum, a s equal to a plus a square plus up to, oops, sorry. The last thing is a to the power n plus 1, not a plus n plus 1, a to the power n plus 1. Subtract the second line from the first line, s minus a s equal to 1 minus a to the power n plus 1. So s equal to 1 minus a to the power n plus 1 by 1 minus a. So 2 plus 4 plus 8 plus up to 2 to the power n is, first take a 2 out, common, then it will be 1 plus 2 plus 4 up to 2 to the power n minus 1, and that's 1 minus 2 to the power n divided by 1 minus 2, that's just 2 to the power n plus 1 minus 2. I, find, I, I, I need just this final result. 2 plus 4 plus 8 up to 2 to the power n is 2 to the power n plus 1 minus 2. This is a straightforward geometric series sum. Now, now, now we are going to see uh, how large the nth prime can be. 
the arrange to the primes in a sequence. Okay, define like before our friend Q equal to P1, P2, Pn plus 1, the product of P1 up to Pn plus 1. Now clearly Q is less than Pn to the power n plus 1 because P1 is less than Pn and P1 is the first one. So they, are, they have been arranged in increasing order. Pn is the largest. So it's Pn, to, P1 is less than Pn, P2 is less than Pn, Pn minus 1 is less than Pn and Pn is just Pn. So I've replaced all Pi's up to n minus 1 by Pn. So Q is less than Pn to the power n plus 1. Agreed? Now the n plus 1 is prime, Pn plus 1 is either Q or something smaller than Q. So Pn plus 1 is less than equal to Q, less than Pn to the power n plus 1. We want to prove that Pn is less than 2 to the power 2 to the power n. So the so it's that that's a that's a very crude upper bound. Uh, okay, but remember this this last display. Pn plus 1 is less than Pn to the power n plus 1. Okay, holds for n equal to uh, induction, holds for n equal to 1. Suppose it holds for n. So then Pn plus 1 is less than this P1, P2 up to Pn plus 1. But what is the induction hypothesis? That Pn is less than 2 to the power 2 to the power n. And that's what I have put here. Once you put that, it becomes a certain power of 2 for which we shall use the geometric series. And I'll, I'll get it. It's 2 to the power, 2 to the power, 2 to the power n plus 1. Okay. I've used here a form of induction which allows me to assume the hypothesis till n for all numbers till n, not just for n, but for all numbers till n, till n, and uh, conclude it for n plus 1. That, that's what has been done. Okay. So this is a, a, a very crude estimate for, for the nth prime, it's less than 2 to the power 2 to the power n. Some simple results involving prime numbers before we go on in a different direction. And that different direction is, is, is a bit of abstract mathematics that I finally want you, want, want you to expose. So this exposure to the abstract mathematics is the, is, it, will, it will come towards the end. Okay. Some, some little, little uh, things that you can play with are, and one thing that I'm, I'm not covering here is called the prime number theorem, which I thought uh, maybe it will be a little too much if it's included here. If n is greater than 1 and a to the power n, min, a to the power n minus 1 is a prime, then a equal to 2 and n is a prime. That's the only possibility when a to the power n minus 1 is a prime. Well, that's simply because a to the power n minus 1 factors as this, a minus 1 and then 1 plus a plus 2 plus dot 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 a to the power n minus 1. So a minus 1 divides a to the power n minus 1. So a to the power n minus 1 cannot be a prime unless a minus 1 is 1, that is a equal to 2. I mean, if a minus 1 is anything bigger than 1, then a to the power n minus 1 is not a prime anymore. So note that we have, now that we have gotten a equal to 2, if n is a composite number, say n equal to kl, if n is a composite number, it can be factored as a product of two numbers, always. In fact, it has a prime power factorization, but we are not using that much. So then 2 to the power n minus 1, or a to the power n minus 1 is now 2 to the power n, minus 1. 2 to the power n minus 1 is 2 to the power k whole to the power l minus 1. And that's 2 to the power k minus 1 into 1 plus 2 to the power k plus 2 to the power k whole square plus all the way up to 2 to the power k whole to the power l minus 1. So now 2 to the power k minus 1 divides 2 to the power n minus 1. So n has to be a prime. I mean, if n is not a prime, 
then you will get a factor of a to the power n minus 1, which is now 2 to the power n minus 1. But you are not allowed any factor because the assumption is a to the power n, n a to the power n minus 1 is a prime. So the only way this can be avoided, a factor can be avoided is n itself is a prime. So no such factorization is possible. n equal to kl is not possible. The moment that becomes possible, you end up obtaining a factor of 2 to the power n minus 1. as an exercise this thing do this it's it's not it's not very difficult if a greater than or equal to 2 and a to the power n plus 1 is a prime then a is even and n is equal to n is a power of 2 and again use something like what we did you, you only have a to the power, all you know is a to the power n plus 1 is a prime and just just use that okay they use the fact that you cannot factor it. Okay. Ah. Study of twin primes has actually led to great results. The pairs of the form 3, 5, 5, 7, 11, 13, that is when two consecutive odd numbers are primes. So it won't hold for 7, 9, for example. Such pairs are called twin primes. Simple observation, apart from 3, 5, any twin prime is of the form 6n minus 1, 6n plus 1 for some n, with 6n sitting in between. Here's a proof. I'm giving these proofs because these are examples of what mathematicians do. So a twin prime is two consecutive odd numbers, right? So they're of the form some 2p minus 1, 2p plus 1. Sorry, I shouldn't have used p is not meant to be a prime here. So, uh, if 2p is not divisible by 3, then there is a number m such that 2p is either 3m plus 1 or 3m plus 2. If 2p is 3m plus 1, then 2p minus 1 is 3m. So, it cannot be a prime. If 2p is equal to 3m plus 2, then 2p plus 1 is a multiple of 3, so it cannot be a prime. So the only possibility is 2p is a multiple of 3. 2p, 2, 2p is a multiple and, and that's what you wanted to show. That's all. Okay. Okay. Now we go into what I what I was saying that it's a uh, how uh, these simple-minded things like the mathematical induction. See, the mathematical induction is nothing, is very intuitive. Let's let's put it that way, right? That you verify something for n equal to 1, and then you prove that if something is true for n minus 1, it is true for n. Or in other words, something is true for n, it's true for n plus 1. Or if something is true for 1, 2, 3, up to n, then it's true for n plus 1. And then the moment you object it for 1, it starts becoming true for 2, true for 3, true for 4, and so on. From there, starting from there, we are le it leads us to somewhere else. For that, I need to, I need to uh, explain what an ordering is. A binary relationship on a set, all of you know what a set is. A binary relationship is something that uh, tells you something between two different elements of the set. That's all. Okay. That's why it's called binary. A binary relationship uh, read as A precedes or equals B between two objects is said to be a linear ordering or a total order if for any two elements A and B, either A less than or equal to B or B less than or equal to A. Keep the set of integers in mind. Odd set or uh, uh, or the set of real numbers. Second is if both a less than equal to if a less than equal to b and b less than equal to a, then this can only happen if a equal to b. So for a not equal to b, one of the relations works. And the relation is transitive. That is, if a is a precedes b and b precedes c, then a precedes c. Such a thing is called an order. So three, three criteria. First one, any two elements are comparable. 
second one says that if a precedes b and b precedes a then a has to be equal to b that is otherwise it's not possible third one is transitivity consider a set with a linear order like the set of integers Assume A to be well ordered. I should have put that in telesized or red marks, red letters. Uh, definition A is said to be well ordered if any non empty subset of A has a least element. Now, this requires an explanation. Take any non empty set of integers, for example, positive integers, it would have a least element. But take the set of all integers, for example, negative and positive. This need not be true because this itself, the whole set itself does not have a list element. Similarly, the real numbers, it has an order, it's an ordered set, but does not have a least element. So, unlike the positive integers or non-negative integers or, or something like that, the the set of all integers z under the natural ordering is not to well ordered. So suppose A is well ordered. For any t, I'm sorry, there's a typo here. For t in A, for t in A, not t in B, for t in A, Denote by this segment of T is mm, sorry, there is too much type of this. All this should be A. For T in A, the segment of, of T is all numbers B in A such that B is less than T. Sorry about the typo. So both the B's here are actually A's. Okay. And now you can prove a theorem which says that if B is a subset of a well-ordered set A satisfying the property that whenever the segment of T is contained, a segment of T is contained in B, then T also belongs to B, then B has to be equal to A. But here the well-ordering of A is important. So assume A to be a well-ordered set and suppose a subset B has the property that for any t in A, whenever segment t is contained in B, then t also belongs to B, then B has to be equal to A. Does it resonate that this is precisely what we were doing in induction for on, on natural numbers? Because then, so if you take A to be the set of all natural numbers, that's a well-ordered set because it has a list element. Uh, segment of t, now t is a natural number. Segment of T will just mean numbers from 1 to n minus 1. Induction hypothesis said that if a property is true for this set, 1 to n minus 1, then it's also true for n. That means the B is the subset of all natural numbers which had satisfied a certain property. Then whenever sec T is contained in B, T is also contained in B. And then the the, what we were saying is that B is the whole set of natural numbers. So this is easy to prove. Uh, suppose B is not the whole of A. So consider the set A minus B. Take a T there. Now, uh, since every, uh, this should be little b. Since every little b less than T is in capital B, else T would not be the least element. T is the least element which is in A but not in B. That means anything below T is actually in B. So say T is contained in B. But by the assumption T is in B, but that's a contradiction. So note that we use the fact that A minus B, A set minus B, this has a least element. And for this the well-ordering principle, the, the, the well-ordering assumption, the fact that A is, A is well-ordered is required. And this also, remember, this also gives you a proof of why mathematical induction works for natural numbers. This is actually a proof 
that mathematic, mathematical induction is a valid process. You can, you can do this. Okay. So in particular, if you, if you take A to be the set of natural numbers, then this justifies uh, mathematical induction. But so far, I have been able to give you only one example of a well-ordered set, namely the natural numbers. The all integers are not, real numbers are not. So this is slightly frustrating, right? Now let's see. Z, the set of all natural numbers, uh, the set of all integers, the set of all integers is not well-ordered under the natural ordering. But I'll now give it a funny ordering. It's an order nevertheless, which will make it well ordered. My funny ordering is this. I am using a different symbol here. I say A precedes B whenever mod A is less than mod B, modulus, just modulus. Or if mod A equal to mod B and A is a negative number and B is a positive. So if mod A is equal to mod B, then you will say that A is less than B. Is a. If mod A equal to mod B means between A and B, one of them is minus A, the other is A. So then you will say minus A is less than A. Otherwise, uh, mod A, so in short, we just ignore the minus sign on numbers, unless we are trying to compare A and minus A, in which case the negative number is small. This will, uh, this is funny because it will give you some funny things like, note that we are saying A precedes B if mod A less than mod B. So this will mean that, for example, uh, um, uh, for example, two will be less than minus two. Two will precede minus seven because you will compare the moduli. But modulus of two is two. Modulus of minus seven is seven. Two. So modulus of two is less than modulus of minus seven. So two precedes minus seven. Now this is strange. That's why it's funny. But you can check that this makes Z a well-ordered set. That is, every non-empty subset would have a least element. So Z, although is not well-ordered in the natural ordering, can actually be made a well-ordered set. This lead, this and many other such examples leads to the question whether any set can be well-ordered. called the well-ordering principle. What's the principle? You would like to prove it, right? In mathematics, we prove things. So people tried proving it for a very long time. I, I don't know whether you know the story of Euclid's fifth postulate. Euclid had five postulates to develop geometry. And for a very, very long time, people tried to prove the fifth postulate, which is really parallel lines, from the other four postulates. For a very, very long time and nobody could do this really. And then people realized that maybe you can develop a different geometry dropping the fifth postulate, which is what Lobachevsky did. And this is called non-Euclidean geometry. So this is a case like that. People prove, try to prove this for a very long time that every set can be well ordered. And Cantor, who, who is the founder of modern set theory, our, our whole of mathematics depends on set theory, okay? And Cantor is the one who kind of brought it up by hand. Cantor de declared in 1883 that in his opinion, the well-ordering, what he called theorem, is a fundamental law of thought, whatever that means. So he considered it very natural, in other words. Zermelo gave a much clearer exposition of Cantor's ideas and eventually went on to show that the well-ordering theorem had many beautiful consequences in mathematics, which is, which is true. And, and I cannot show you some of those kind of consequences, but, but this is true. At about the same time, Borel was a very famous mathematician, um, well, contradicted Zermelo, said that, well, no, you cannot assume this. This cannot be proved and hence cannot be assumed. So there was a running controversy whether it's all right to assume the line that I have written in red at the top or not. If you don't assume that, a lot of things cannot be done. Finally, it has been shown that the well-ordering principle can neither be proved nor disproved. 
using other axioms of set theory. It's a case like Euclid's fifth postulate. Uh, the, the, the framework of set theory on which we work is, is generally known as the zermelo frankel set theory. The zermelo frankel axioms can neither prove nor disprove the well-ordering principle. So if one takes it, one has to take it as an axiom. Adding to the fuel of the, skept of the skepticists is the fact that it has been proved that no well-ordering on the real numbers can be explicitly displayed. Now it's up to you to decide whether you want to take well-ordering principle as part of your mathematics or not. Uh, there are some modern mathematicians who still do not like it, but by and large, we, we accept it as, a, as an axiom, and beautiful things can be done consequently. Well-ordering principle is equivalent to something called Zons lemma. That is the form in which it is most used and, uh, and, and is used all the time in modern mathematics. Okay, I think I'll uh, stop with that. These are some of the references. They are all on the web. I would strongly recommend these. Along with that, you can do your own uh, Google search. It's close to an hour. And thank you.